And just let me say good evening to everyone who is available for our study this evening. It's good to have the opportunity to share with you again. Um, tonight, our study is going to be involving an area which is going to be very deep because we have a lot of different theological perspectives in relation um, to this particular doctrinal position. And it involves a lot of interpretation from symbolic and figurative language that is used in the Bible. It means that we have to be a little bit more liberal in our understanding of other people's positions because a lot of what we have to deal with in relation to the theology of the Antichrist is connected to various interpretations based on a language that I, I already indicated that is very symbolic, very figurative, because there are not a lot of definitive positions established in, in the word in connection to this particular theological perspective. It means you have to go open to the variety of positions because different theologians are Based in their doctrinal stance on interpretations from the word. And so we have to bear that in mind when we are engaged in this study. We have a great, have a great for a week. So I hope you will use the opportunity to read back some of the scriptures that we were dealing with, especially those from Matthew chapter 24 and 25. So you get a clear understanding of some of the things that we were, we were trying to establish from those chapters and I would recommend that you take the opportunity to look at the parables that Jesus would have identified in Matthew chapter 21 and 22 just before he went into the Olivet discourse because those two parables establish a position which I was trying to identify for you in, in relation to the fact that the destruction of Jerusalem was more than just an event in, in history. It represented a, a change from the old covenant relationship with the Jews to a new covenant relationship with the Gentile church. Of course, the, the Jews are included in, in that as well. And, and so those two parables give you a very clear indication where Jesus indicated that the kingdom God is taken from the Jews and given to a nation that will bring forth fruit. So that's, that's the significance of what happened at the destruction of the temple. So the judgment on, on the Jews for rejecting the Messiah, rejecting the prophets that were sent to them. But of course, it was not just a judgment, but it was also a transfer of God's purpose, which now it becomes prominent in the, in the church. So I would recommend that you read those two parables and see the connection um, to what I was trying to establish. Okay, so the theology of the Antichrist is a, a very interesting study to be engaged in. It's going to take us some time because we, we have to make the effort to try to understand precisely the literature from which the interpretations, the of interpretation that we have are based. We, we must bear in mind also that the Old Testament does not give any specific reference to the Antichrist in terms of using that, that description. The only place in the, in, in the world we have the word actually used is in the book, the epistles of 1 John, which we will have to examine because using the, the principle that they have identified in terms of, of biblical hermeneutics, we start from what is given to us as the known and in language that is, is pretty simple and clear to understand. And we will use that then to help us to interpret 
the other passages from which interpretations are based. Because this study is going to bring us into the study of the book of Revelations, because that's one of the, the main passages that have been identified by the premillennialists. That's Revelation chapter 13, where they have, which they have identified as the basis for their theological position on how they see the Antichrist, and who he represents, and, and, and his purpose, and his activity. So we, we're going to have to pay very careful attention to, to, to that passage. And then we're going to have to examine the book of Daniel, because they draw references as well from the book of Daniel to support their perspective of the Antichrist. And we're going to have to look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, because that connects them with the Antichrist and the Battle of Armageddon. So we will look at that a little further down in our study, but that is also connected to the, to the whole theology of the Antichrist. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is to identify what is the, is the main theological perspective. So when we're doing that, you know we have to go with premillennialism pre first because that is the pervading view and a lot of the theology surrounding in time events um, has a larger support um, among the denominations the premillennial view so establish that position clearly we will we will start from how they view the Antichrist, who he represents. And then we're going to look at the interpretation of the, the scriptural references that they use to support that theological perspective. And then we're going to cross-reference um, those interpretations with other opinions expressed with other theologians from the amillennialist group and from the post-millennialist group. As I said, we have to examine these with an openness reason why is because a lot of things are not specific and clearly defined but you can say well this is it but we can say to a muslim the bible says that we get to god through christ because jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me that's precise that's very clear there's no figurative language used there that is very clear and simple when it comes to the theology of, of antichrist it is not that defined. It is not that that clearly um, identified. So it means then that people are going to have different interpretations because there's going to be a lot of symbolic language. There's going to be a lot of figurative language, which lends itself to interpretation. So it is going to be very difficult to say to an individual that well, you are wrong with your interpretation. I am right with my interpretation. What we will need to do is examine the basis for the interpretation and look at how they assess the symbolic language that is used, compare it with references that are used um, throughout the Bible, and see what conclusions we can draw and, and what, what truth we can identify based on, on the comparative analysis that we will have to use so that we can get a clear understanding and, and a fairly well-defined perspective. So according to the premillennialists, the Antichrist is a term applied to a world leader who will emerge after the rapture. As far as they're concerned, the term Antichrist refers to an individual. And he is going to be a world leader who emerges after the rapture, so which means then that from the very beginning, this identifies that they see the, rap, the, the, the Antichrist as a person who is going to emerge in the future. Because there's a theological perspective that would indicate that Antichrist is making reference to a, a past um, figure in history or a religious system. So their, their, their understanding is that the Antichrist is, is going to come in the future. So he will emerge at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. So 
far as they're concerned, the church is raptured before the tribulation takes place. And then tribulation on the earth would emerge and the Antichrist would come out as a leader who is going to promise world peace and who is going to promise that he will be able to bring some stability to what is happening in the world. And so he will have a, a major following. And he would superimpose himself on, on the world. According to their, their system of interpretation, the Antichrist should emerge from a revived Roman Empire. So he's supposed to be coming out of the revived European economic community or the European common market because they believe that the Roman Empire, which was destroyed, will emerge in the future and it will be represented by the 10 nations that form a confederacy which we call the European Economic Community or European Common Market, which is more commonly called the European Union. But that, that union started in 1957, with six nations signing a treaty in Rome. By January 1981, the European Union or the European Common Market had reached the magic number of 10. But they believe the 10 horns are related to a united Roman Empire, which will bring 10 nations together in the future to be a revived um, form of the Roman Empire, which was a past world empire. So when that number reached 10 in 1981, you can imagine how excited the premillennialists got because they figured that, hey, this, this supports our view. And this is really a fulfillment of prophecy coming in the past. So when they saw that happen, then they would start to predict that, hey, we can look for a rapture now because we have a system in place which represents our interpretation of what we believe those, those 10 tools coming back together will represent. But by 1990, the membership had increased to 15. So you see, you must be very careful if you don't have a, a definite position position on, on a prophecy, you have to be very careful of your interpretation, especially if the language is symbolic. Now, when, when Jeremiah predicted that Nebuchadnezzar will come and go to Jerusalem, he was very specific because he was given a specific prophecy by God, and he was able to say that they will be taken captive in Babylon for 70 years, and after 70 years, they will get their freedom to, to go back the land of Judah. So was prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah was even specific in calling the name of the king that would be in power at the time when a decree would be given for them to go back to Jerusalem. So, so that's what you call specific prophecy. And you don't need to have to interpret that because it's specific. And you will see the fulfillment of it and it did occur in, in history. And imagine Isaiah was able to call the name of the leader even before he became the leader. And, the, and, the, and Jeremiah was also talking about the restoration of the temple. And the prophecy was given by Jeremiah even before the temple was destroyed. So that's how precise prophecy can be. But very often, we will take prophecy that might be given and sometimes the prophecy may have a fulfillment that has occurred in the past. But because of our theological position and our theological perspective, this is what we are dealing with, theological perspective on event events, we sometimes project those events for the future, just like what we would have done with Matthew chapter 24. Even though Jesus was speaking to a precise group of people, giving a specific prophecy for a specific time, there are theologians that still take that and project it to a future. And sometimes this is what happens with a lot of prophecy that would be given in the Bible. We make projections for the future. So they saw the revival of the, of the, Roman, of the Roman Empire in the form of the economic community. And then, like I said, by 1990, it had increased to 15 members. And I, I know I think it stands at 27. So, so then that, that throws their, their Particular theological perspective 
you know, out of, out of, out of sync. But according to their theology, we go on, they, they, this leader would emerge and he would pose what Christ stands for and he exalts himself as if he is God, according to their interpretation from Revelation 13, which we will examine carefully tonight. And that he would have a, a mark that he would ask people to take. This is where people believe in the literal mark 666, which people will have inscribed on the cord on their hand. And if you don't have that mark, then you will not be able to buy yourself. That's their interpretation of that. So they are taking their theology in, in a literal interpretation of what they would have seen in the book of Revelations. And before we actually go into examining that particular theology from Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, we would need to get a, a background understanding of how we should go about interpreting Revelation based on the nature of the writing in that book. Now, be very careful when we have symbolic language that we are playing the symbols accurately. And we have to also be, care be, care be careful that we do not take language that is meant to be symbolic and interpret it in a literal way, because again, it can show us our target in, in our assessment of the position. So the Antichrist would establish a covenant with the Jews in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation is going to be a period of seven years, and that interpretation has come from their understanding of Daniel chapter nine, which we will, which we will also examine. And so in the first three and a half years, he would establish a covenant with the Jews. And then in the second three and a half years, he would break that covenant. And he would then join some other nations which would come up against the Jews. And he would establish a, a battle against the Jews, which would culminate, according to their theology, in the Battle of Armageddon. And then Jesus will return and he'll be involved in the slaughter of all these nations in the defense of the Jews. That particular form of interpretation is connected to their understanding of the, the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, as, as, as I indicated earlier, we must be sure that when we are, are looking at prof prophecy, that, that we are clear that that prophecy has not been fulfilled because it was referenced to something else that perhaps we did not recognize that it was, it was addressing. And so we see it as, as a future um, reference because we did not actually see the fulfillment in history. So you're going to have to, to, to do some study into church history to get an understanding of what we need to consider when we are trying to establish a doctrine based on the prophetic language used in books like Daniel, Ezekiel, and in the book of Revelation. So there are images that they associate with the Antichrist coming from these particular passages. Like in Daniel, who speaks of the little horn, they, they interpret the little horn to be an image of the, of the Antichrist. They also look at the prince that is to come in Daniel 9.26 as a representation of the Antichrist. The king of a fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23, and the willful king in Daniel 11, 36 to 45. So they pick up on these images and the language that is used in, in the prophecy and, and they, they align that with their interpretation of this man who is to come in the future. So they, they, they will not assume then that those references could have been of a person that Daniel was speaking of that could have been a historical figure that actually came on the scene and fulfilled the purpose that he was addressing in his prophecy. No, their interpretation is that this is a reference to someone who is to come in the future. Then they also look at Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the second Thessalonians, and the man of sin and the lawless one that the apostle Paul speaks, of, speaks about in, in, in 
that particular book. They again align that interpretation to be the Antichrist. They, they definitely conclude that Antichrist is a person to come in the future. He has not been revealed, he has not come on the scene, and statements and references that would imply that it could have been a class, a historical figure, they say no. And their view is that he's going to come in the future. So this is the prevailing view. This is the view of the majority of evangelical groups because it's a criminal position. And the criminalists, as I indicated to you from the very beginning of the study, uh, form maybe about 70, 75 percent of the theologians of that particular school. Now, as I mentioned before, there is no specific identification of the, the word antichrist in, in none of those references, in any of those references that I just mentioned from the book of Daniel. Little Horn, the prince that is to come, the king of a fierce continent, the willful king, or the man of sin um, from the apostle Paul or the lawless one. Those are just terms. The word antichrist is not used, even though the interpretation is that refers to the Antichrist to come. Now, John, this is first John, the epistles of John. That's the only reference we have in the Bible where really, the actual word is the priestly Antichrist. Some people say Antichrist. But the prefix there from the Greek could mean one who can't stand against or stand in the place of. Anti could mean against or in the place of. So, the interpretation then of the Antichrist would be somebody who stands against what God represents or puts himself in a position to exalt himself if he is God. So that's the interpretation of their particular view of the Antichrist. So what we're going to do is to look at the passages in 1 John and see what is John's perspective. He's using the word, and it's the only part, as they say in the Bible, where the word is used. So we have to take that seriously, and we have to pay um, very close attention to how John defines Antichrist. And we have to be thinking in our mind, Antichrist, a person, is it a religious system, a political system, or does it represent all three? So let's look at 1 John. And the first passage we're going to look at is 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Indicating we're going to have to go through this passage very carefully and very slowly because we are, we are going to be doing some very deep analysis and interpretation to try to get a clear understanding of how we should view the theology of the Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John writes, little children, it is the last time. We have to get a clear understanding of what that represents. Last time here means the last dispensation or the, the latter times as you, you, you have seen or the last days. It's a concept that is used very often in the New Testament to refer not necessarily to the time coming before Christ's return. As many of the criminalists use that phrase to interpret, when they see that phrase, the last time or the last days, or the latter days, that it's supposed to be a period of time just before the return of Christ. The last days coming to the end of the world. But really, should we be examining closely how the, the apostles interpret it? And remember, that's one of the principles we identified in hermeneutics. Look for how you do testament writers interpret certain phrases or interpret certain statements that have come also from the Old Testament and see what their view is because we have to take their interpretation and their understanding. That's very important. Now, Paul writes in Hebrews, God at sundry times and in diverse manners, Hebrews chapter one, spoke to us by the prophets, but in these last days, has spoken to us by his son. Obviously, he could not mean the last days, which would be a few 
years before Christ returns, he is speaking that of a dispensation, which they believe represents the time of Christ's advent to the time he returns. So it's a period of time for dispensation. Also remember in the book of Joel, Joel said, in the last days, God will call his spirit from all flesh, and young men shall see visions and, and dream dreams, etc. And we sometimes look for that to be a future event as a last day event. But remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, when they spoke in, in tongues, spoke in the languages that people could understand that were gathered, he said that that was a fulfillment of the prophecy which was spoken by Joel. And he said in the last days, so which means then that the accounts of the last days could not then have been referring to the very last days before um, Christ returns. Peter uses the, the statement as well. So the understanding is it, it represents a dispensational period. And sometimes it might, might, might refer to the, the last period before Christ returns, and often you see the last day. So when John says that it is the last time, he is re he referring to we are in the last dispensation, we are in the last days, which is in the time of Christ. And he says, and ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Ye have heard. So which means that the council of the Antichrist was mentioned before in their time. So it's not a concept that we are looking for to be projected to the future as the premillennialists um, so are so adamant about. John is saying to the people he is speaking to at that time, and he was addressing these epistles to Christians. He says, little children, this is the last sign, and ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Jesus in Matthew 24 spoke about people coming and pretending to be Christ and to be false prophets and told his degeneration that is going to be present to look for these things as signs that are going to come before the, the, the temple is destroyed. So John could have been making reference of things that would have been mentioned by Jesus. You have heard that Antichrist shall come. And he said, even now, there are many Antichrists. So, so watch carefully what John is saying. He is using the word. He is saying that during the last dispensation, and that they have heard that Antichrist will come, even in that dispensation. And he says, even now, even now, there are many Antichrists. So according to John, his perspective is, it is not an individual, but it is people who represent a position that will identify them as anti-Christ, meaning going against what Christ stands for, or putting themselves in the place as if they were Christ and pretending to be Christ. Then we have 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. God says, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So he gives a definition again of who can be classified as antichrist. So of course it would mean that anybody who denies that Jesus is the Christ is putting himself in the to be classified as antichrist. So his focus is not on an individual again, but anybody who comes into that group. And, and John was addressing the heresy and, and false teaching that was going on at his time. And he is writing to Christians, warning them about these persons that are going to come trying to deny Christ and deny the deity of Christ. And he considers them as antichrist. And as I said, remember Jesus said that before. The, the temple was destroyed, that you're going to have people coming pretending to be Christ and, 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 and are going to identify themselves as false Christ. First John chapter 4, 2 to 3. To give me a little time if you have your Bible with you that you can turn to the references. Or you can just write them down and after the study you can go back to them and read them through. 
Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Again, John is writing, dealing with heresies that existed at the time, false teachings that were going on at the time. And there was a group that, that believed. I think it was a group that, that came out of Gnosticism, which believed that, that Christ could not come in the flesh because the flesh is sinful. It's an area of philosophy. That the flesh is sinful, so God cannot be incarnated in flesh. So Jesus Christ would not come in the flesh because the flesh is sinful. So they, they saw Christ as some sort of phantom spirit. He's not a person that is flesh and blood because God is not one come in the flesh. And that's why John later don't say, but we have touched him. We have handled him. We have, we have fought with him. We have the evidence that we were dealing with a real person and not a spirit being. So he's saying that any spirit that is saying that Jesus is not coming in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. Mention that again. Uh, even now, it is already in the world. So pay very careful attention to the statements made by John because he's the only person that is actually using the word. As I said, we don't see it in the Old Testament, even though references are drawn from the Old Testament to refer to the Antichrist. It was not a word that was used in the Old Testament. Even when Paul addressed the man of sin and the lawless one, he never used the word antichrist, but these are references drawn from the premillennial theology to refer to the person they believe is coming in the future who represents this man of sin who takes control over the world and, and he creates a whole lot of, of, of problems for the Jews and then for the, the rest of the world at large. John is saying that already that spirit for itself. So he defines it as a spirit. He defines it as individuals who oppose what Christ stands for or who try to represent themselves as if they were Christ. And so he gave us a clear indication of how he views the concept of the Antichrist. Pay careful attention to the fact that he mentions that they have heard that the Antichrist was to come. So it was something that was taught to them. The Apostle Paul even made mention of that when he was with the, the Thessalonians. He told them about those things. So John is confirming that, that this whole concept of Antichrist was something that was taught and that the Christians have heard of Antichrist. And John is saying he is already in the world. And he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, even now there are many Antichrists. Then we have another passage in 2 John, chapter 1, verse 7. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. They mention that again. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So again, from our interpretation, John is given the representation of Antichrist representing more than one person. He's given the definition of person that can be classified as Antichrist. Now, is there a possibility that somebody could come in the future pretending to be Christ incarnated by the devil? Because that's what the premillennialists believe that the Antichrist could come in the future is going to be incarnated with the devil. Just like Jesus Christ came as our mediator and he was incarnated with the power and the spirit of God. Satan's opposition to that is to bring someone in the future who he would put his spirit in and he would allow that person to be worshipped as if he is God. So in other words, Satan will be getting his worship through that personality because he knows Satan desires 
bullshit. So we're going to look now then at the main passage which they use to support their view. And this is from the book of Revelation, chapter 13. So we look at the New Testament passage. We're going to come back to Paul um, a little later. The reason why I'm moving to, to Revelation 13 is because this, this is the main support passage for the premillennial interpretation of the future and Christ that is to come, represented by the beast in this particular passage. Now, what we have to bear in mind when we are in interpreting the book of Revelation is that we are dealing with very heavy symbolic language. Figurative language, very symbolic. And it is identified in the very first chapter in the prologue of the book that Jesus is giving the revelation to John and he is signifying it by his servant, by his servants. So it means that it is given in signs and symbols. That's very clear. So we must bear that in mind. It's heavy symbolic language. So when we are reading Revelation, we have to be careful of taking things literally. It's Symbols carry meaning. They represent something. And, and if we keep some of these symbols literally, we could find ourselves uh, coming up with theology that presents some problems. We also have to remember that we have a parallel to Revelation that is in Daniel, because Daniel also uses the symbol of beast as is used in Revelation chapter 13 and which can be on chapter 17. So we must also compare scripture with scripture, symbol with symbol. And bear in mind that the visions that Daniel received where he saw beasts in his vision and he was given an interpretation for those beasts by the angel and he was puzzled. So we have to take that also very seriously in terms of the interpretation given by the angel. So the vision is given from heaven and the interpretation is, is, is given to Daniel to assist him in understanding what it means. So we also have to parallel that with what happens in Revelation. Because remember, the vision that John is seeing is also given to him from heaven. Jesus is, is, is given, it's the revelation of Christ given to John. These are not images that John is just coming up with. Just the, the vision that Daniel had and the beast he saw were not things that he was just conjuring up in his head. They were visions given to him from, from heaven. And so John is also getting visions from heaven. So we have to bear that in mind. And that's why the, the parallel is very, very important. And how these symbols are used and interpreted will also be very important because they're coming from the same source. We have to bear that in mind. We are interpreting the beast and what the beast represents in the book of Revelation. Also, what we have to bear in mind is that when we are projecting the majority of what we see in Revelation as the future, that's a futuristic interpretation, and the premillennialists um, predominantly have a futuristic interpretation of Revelation. What they argue is that after the first three chapters in Revelation, which deal with the churches, that the letters are going to be sent, but the book is going to be sent to, that from the time you pick up chapter four onward, Revelation basically deals with the future. Everything that is written in the book is for the future. Let's take a very clear understanding of what first chapter in Revelation 6, which is the prologue to the book. And I'm going to ask that we look at that because there are statements made in there that are very important. Before we even attempt to explain anything from Revelation, this is the background that we must have and understand. We're using symbols. The revelation is given to John, so it's not something that he's come up with. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first chapter says, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. 
notice that phrase. So when we are interpreting Revelation simply as a futuristic book, that everything else, everything in it points to the future that we must look for in our, even in our own time, bear in mind that the prologue to the book starts off by saying that the things which must shortly come to pass that were sent to be signified by the angel unto the servant John, who bear a record of the word of God, that's all he did, of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of the things that he saw. So John was just described Jesus is really the author. It's coming from him. Revelation is coming from Jesus, given to John, which he wants him to send to the churches. Blessed is he that readeth, and the things that, and they, sorry, that hear the word of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Watch that phrase again. For the time is at hand. So those are two words that are mentioned there that give an indication that at least, if not all, because the book does make reference of, of the, the, the mature judgment and the, the, the resurrection of, of the dead coming out of the sea and final judgment, which will have to be a future event. It does mention um, the, the future of, of, of Christians dwelling in, 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 the, in the new Jerusalem that John saw coming down. But of course, there, there are other interpretations to that which we will not deal with at this point in time. But I just want to mention to you here the, the, the background which we must have in mind when we are reading Revelation. So even when we come to examine Revelation 13, which speaks about the beast, Revelation 17, you have to be bearing in mind that what is being shown to John is things that must shortly come to pass, which means that some of the things that we're going to be reading in Revelation will have had to be fulfilled close to John's time. So they could have been a future, yes, in terms of what John is seeing, but they could have been very near future, close to the hand not a future projected some 2,000 years down the road, which we have not seen yet, but which we are still waiting to see. Because the Antichrist is still to be unfold. He is still to be revealed to us. And the truth is, if we take the premillennial view as correct, we, we will not get a chance to see him manifested to be able to see that the prophecy is accurate because according to them, Christians will be gone from this world. We would have been raptured. And the Antichrist is only revealed after we are taken from the world. So we will not even get a chance to, to, to see the revelation of the Antichrist from, from, from the earth. But again, there's a school of theologians who believe that we will go through the tribulation. So even if there, there is that manifestation, their theology is that the amillennialists and the postmillennialists, that we will be here during the tribulation period that is to come on earth, as um, many theologians seem to indicate. So symbolic language, some of the things mentioned in John will have to be close to John's time, which as some theologians indicate, there could be possible reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, to the, to the persecution that is going to take place, or is already taking place, because John mentioned that he was their partner in tribulation, so it was already taking place by the Roman Empire. And we will go on to see when we look at other perspectives that some people believe that, that the beast represents somebody who would have been present in John's time. But again, as I said, these are interpretations and what we're going to do is look at the main interpretations and see how they analyze the scripture, how they interpret the symbols, and if they have a strong enough argument or good enough rationale for the position which they hold, that's the best we can do. Because as I say, there's no definitive, precise description that we can say that how Jeremiah and Isaiah prophesied, hey, this is what it is, because this is precisely what the word is saying. These are all interpretations, so we will be examining the, the different perspectives. So there's there, there are some who believe that reference to the Antichrist would be referring to individuals who were already part of history and 
there are others who believe that I'm Christ is a future personality to come. There's some who might not even believe in it in a personality represented by Antichrist, but by a system. There, there are some who believe that the, the, the papacy and the Roman Catholic system is the, the representation of, of what these, these symbols could indicate in the book of Revelation. But uh, as I indicate to you, we're going to go through these very slowly, very precisely, and we're going to take um, the passages that are, are given as the indicators for the theological perspective. We try to examine them closely and see how they could apply. But so just bear that in mind when we look at Revelation, that some of the events would have to be close to John's time based on the prologue and the introduction to the book that we have here. Also bear in mind that this book is going to be sent to churches. Those churches that John identified as the seven churches, this book is supposed to be sent to them for them to read and to understand. And when I think through this, I will, I will be, be thinking that it would be very unreasonable for, for, for Jesus to be sending um, information to the churches with this type of symbolism that they have to get the wisdom and the spirit to understand. And then it practically does not apply to them at all. Meaning that if we think that it's all in the future, it means that it is a waste of time sending it to these people, ask them to read it and interpret it as if it's, it's supposed to apply to them. Then to realize, well, hey, this, this doesn't concern you. This is all to happen maybe 2,000 years or more down the road. To me, that does not really make any sense. And this is why I believe that some of what is written in Revelation have applied to the churches that the letters would have been sent, the letter, the book would have been sent to. And that some of these things will have to apply to them for them to understand really what it was saying. Now, you may not agree with that position, but I, I think that, that that is a reasonable way to do this. Just like it would not have made any sense for Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 to be saying to the people, look for these signs. These are signs that you need to be aware of that will indicate that we are coming close to the destruction of this temple the abomination of desolation. And when you see certain things happen, you better seek to escape. It would not, to me, have made a lot of sense to be saying that to people if we are going to take Matthew chapter 24 and then say that all of those things refer to something in the future. Then why would Jesus have been telling the people to look at these things? That would not have made any sense. In a similar way, since Jesus asked John to, to, to circulate this among the, the churches, I believe that things they hear but have to be making sense to these people have an application that they could understand. Remember they were on persecution by the Roman emperors. And if their information in here connected to those emperors that, that, that Jesus wants to be disguised, but only interpreted by the Christians who will get the wisdom and the understanding to follow the symbols and read what is, is, is there, then you can see the reason for using this type of language because it is to hide it from the Romans who will not basically understand that some of it might relate into them. But the Christians who will get the wisdom and the intelligence from the spirit will be able to understand and see how it will apply to what is going on and give them the assurance that in spite of the persecution they're going through, that they're going to get a victory in the end. Now, before I pick up on Revelation, 13, I just pause here to see if you want to ask any questions or make any comments or express any views before we pick up on Revelation 13. We are starting here because this is the main um, chapter that the premillennialists use to support their understanding of the Antichrist and the beast and the mark what is to happen in the future, how this is all going to unfold from this particular passage. So we need to study it carefully, understand the symbols, and we're going to make a comparison with the book of Daniel to see how we can be aided in the interpretation of the symbols here and see how it connects with what was revealed to Daniel. So I pause.
Any comments about how John saw the Antichrist? And if it clarifies any position for you about the Antichrist, if you, you see that, that theological concept any different? I saw something come up from Sandra Pollard, but I didn't uh, get all of this. Yeah, you saw it? Yeah, she's querying um, now if any part of the Bible speaks to a future time for our generation, given what we've been now discussing. If any part of if any part of the Bible speaks to a future time for our generation. Any future time for our generation? Of, of, of course it does. But you have to then define precisely what, what you, you, you refer to. Because I believe symbolically the Bible speaks about persecution that, that the church will, will undergo. It has already started. And we are going to have to endure persecution. We are going to have people opposing us, and we have already seen it, and the Bible, the Bible does address that. We have to be able to stand strong in persecution. As I indicated when we look at Matthew chapter 24, we can have we can have a dual application to that. Even, even though Jesus was speaking to a specific group of people, we can we can still reference some of those things as a possible um, sort of double application, which would then mean that we could see wars, we could see earthquakes. We see famine, famine and diseases and pestilence as, as part of what could come in our time. We can make the dual application. Even though Jesus was not specifically speaking of our time, he was speaking of, of that generation, we can, we can still see that there's a possibility that we can, we can have um, a dual application. And we, and we can still possibly look for some of these things as being part of our world. It's always been. Well, that being said, I, 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 I remember, remember there are different interpretations to the Antichrist, and, and, and which could refer to our time as well, but we will, we will get to see that as we look at other interpretations. So yes, there's a past interpretation to the Antichrist, but there is a, there's a future one as well. Future in, future to come, but, but part of what has been established when we look at the papacy, people believe that that the, the, the papacy was represented in the interpretation from Revelation, and that and that, and that the, the Pope could represent a figure to come in the future that can seek to establish a, a one world system, bring it to a religious system. This is where people view ecumenism as part of the plan of the Pope to bring us back together as one. Because remember. The papacy wants to control the whole world as a religious system. We have to bear that in mind. So when we get to look at interpretation of the papacy and the Pope as, as what Revelation is revealing, we can get an understanding of how that could be possibly seen as past, but also future. And we could also look at the whole concept of, of, of the peace and what that represents, whether it's a literal mark, whether it's a, a literal person, or if it is representative of a system that would be opposing what Christianity stands for, unless we go along with, with, with the system or, or the worldview, we will be persecuted and we will have pressure placed on us. And we can see already how much pressure is being placed on Christians because of the stand we take. So the mark may not necessarily be a literal mark, but it might be a, a, an identification with a world system a way of life that once you do not stand for that and you oppose it, you are persecuted because that's what happened to the Christians in the past. And there was not a little mark they had. And we would also recognize in Revelation that Christians also have a mark. And it is a literal mark. We will see later down in Revelation that the Bible speaks about a seal that Christians carry on their forehead. Is that a literal seal? So you see, when we are, are studying 
is, is symbolism in the Bible, we, we must bear in mind that there is figurative language and there are applications to it. Remember, the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit whereby we are sealed until the day of redemption. Now, now a seal was a literal seal that the, the, the Roman governors and emperors carried that they, they put as a, as a stamp of authority on, on, on things, a seal. And so when the word seal is used in the Bible, do we have a literal seal that we carry as Christians? Or is there a spiritual representation in that? When you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and, and it says, when, when, the, when the, in Deuteronomy take chapter 6, and it says about the, the laws that were given, the parents were to, to put them on, 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 the, on the children's hands, and there will be to be like frontlets between their eyes. Now, was that to be taken literally? You see, there's a lot of symbolic language used in the Bible, and it has meaning. You know, if you apply it rightly, rightly divided it, of course you can have a future application to it. The symbolism can have future purpose and future meaning. But we, we must be careful of how dogmatic, how precise we are in saying, well, this is what represents if we are interpreting symbols. We must be open, as they say, to say, well, there's a possibility that it could mean this, or possibility it could mean that. Look at it carefully. We compare it with as much scriptures available and see what it means. So yes, there, there are references to future um, that we will experience in the Bible. And, and we will get a chance, as says, we go through and we study to see how we can have future application to what we're going to be studying. So I will say yes to that. Now you have two questions, Reverend Jackman. You have one from Ian Innes and one from Glenda. So Ian, you can go ahead and ask your question and then um, Glenda, you can follow immediately after um, Ian's question has been answered. Hi, good evening, Reverend Jackman. Um, yes. It's not really, it's not really a, a question, it's like an observation. You mentioned about um, persecution in the church um, yes. being relevant now. In, in, yeah. When I look at the history of who we are, I don't think that persecution has ever stopped. Um, That's right. If you're talking about if you're talking about antichrist, and if antichrist is anything that is against or opposed to Christ, we've had this all along. Yes. He he himself experienced that. So as we look at the history of the church and all that we've gone through in that, all the world wars, all the dark ages, everything that the devil has set up has been in opposition to the gospel. Everything that he has put in the systems of this world, that's what he's called the God of this world, has been put in place. So the whole thing is antichrist. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. So as I look at it, I always see all of, what we go through as persecution. So when we look into the world today, look at what is happening in terms of what is being propagated against the gospel, against the church. So the whole thing about persecution to me has been an ongoing process because the devil's plan is to stop you from seeing God's face. So everything that he has put in the world is anti-Christ. So that, that's just the observation that I wanted to share. Yes, and, I, and I, I agree with you, Ian, that that's my perspective on it. It has always been, been part of the Christian experience. So what Jesus was addressing was what those people experienced in, in that generation, but it has always been opposition um, to, the, to the church. From the time the church started, there was opposition. Um, and Revelation even identified that with the woman that the dragon pursued from the time she gave birth um, to, to, to her child. The dragon represented the, the devil was after the child. So, so the devil is just the person who infuses opposition to the church. And, and John already identified in the concept of Antichrist. He said, listen, we already have this spirit present with us. It's already in the world. So, so that's my point. We are not looking for Antichrist to come as a person. The Antichrist was already present. But, but if people want to um, look at the symbols in the Bible and interpret them um, for a, a, future, a future personality, that's their interpretation. But what happens very often is that they look at world events 
and try to make the scripture match with world events. You watched prophecy. Prophecy was made long before even the world events started and it was fulfilled. So you see in Daniel, the kingdoms that you look at were prophesied long before they, were, they, 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 they even came and established themselves and, and the description of, of what they were represent and what Jeremiah saw, what Isaiah saw, and even in, 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 in prophecies about Jesus long before and, and they were fulfilled. I am saying that if, if things are, are meant to be prophetically fulfilled, they will. And we will just wait and see them unfold. What I'm saying is that chances are that a lot of the prophecies that we might be looking to be fulfilled in the future might have already been fulfilled. We might be looking for a, a, a dual application to them and looking for them to take place in the future, but we have to be careful of that and recognize that we, we have fulfillment for a lot of things that people are still projecting in the future. And, and when we look at Daniel, when we look at some parts of Revelation, we, we, we will begin to see some of these things unfold before us as we, we understand the, the, the Bible history and the church history. So yes, I agree with you that a lot of these things have already been in place. It's just people believe that it might increase in intensity we have already been persecuted and we will continue to be persecuted. And, and the good news is that we will prevail because God has promised that, that the kingdom of darkness cannot prevail against the church. So the church will be triumphant and will be victorious. And, and that's what is the general theme of the Bible. The victory that we will get over Satan and his forces. All right, next question. Good night, Reverend Jackman. It's not, really a question. it's not really a question as such, but I need to get your views on mm -hmm. Revelation, chapter, Revelation chapter 13 and verse, and verse 3, where it talks about um, one of the heads um, had been mortally wounded, and then the deadly wound was healed. And I was discussing with some friends when we were discussing the book of Revelation, and it came out that the papacy many, many years ago received a deadly wound. And that's when the Pope was taken captive and stripped of all his political powers and stuff like that. And then sometime after that, there was an agreement with the Catholic leaders to reinstate the political status back to the Vatican. And we find that the Catholic church has then grown significantly that it, so, so far that even world leaders are seeing the Pope as the spiritual leader. And the latter part of the same verse, it says, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So is that latter part ties in with the growth of this, um, the Catholic Church now? And where many world leaders are following the Catholic Church? Right, that's, that's a very good question. And, and that, that is based on one of the theologi theological perspectives. Remember, we are dealing with symbols, and, and, and theologians in different schools, different camps, have different interpretations on, on some of these same symbols. Now, as we begin to look at them in, in more detail, we won't get to look at all of them tonight, but we have three main positions. There is one school that sees what we have here representing the beast and the symbolism surrounding it, refers to Nero. And I will show you how the symbols apply. I will try to break them down for you, to show you what are the characteristics identified of the beast, how they would fit in if you use Nero, as the person representing, which means that it's already passed. We will look to see how the symbols will relate if you're looking for the Antichrist to come in the future. Some, some people predicted that he was Hitler. That proved not to be the case. We had Mussolini. That proved not to be the case. We had Gaddafi. Some people even saying that Barack Obama was the Antichrist. Some even saying Donald Trump was the Antichrist. Some people saying that oh, the vaccine is the mark of the beast. All of those things, people are thrown interpretation which are, cannot be prophetic because prophecy can't mean all of these different things. As I show you from, from um, Jeremiah 
and, and from Isaiah, and we see from Daniel, they have to be specific applications to the prophecy if it's to be real. And it makes sense. It can't be all over the place. And you can't be changing it when it suits you, when it does not work out. That's not how prophecy works. So there's, so there's one school that believe this refers to Nero, so that would already have been passed. And there's one school, and, we, and many of the theologians of the, of the amillennial group into which we fall, and some of our theologians reading some of the, of the past um, books written by theologians from the Church of God Reformation Movement. We don't have a lot of books written by theologians in the Church of God Reformation Movement related to a lot of prophetic events. That's, that's the issue. We have a lot of amillennials online, and you can see a, a lot of information. Um, I, I said I would give you some of the names, I already gave you some. There are amillennials which fit into the same um, theological grouping as the Church of God Reformation Movement. But some of them have different perspectives. So you're going to find a variety of interpretations based on how people are interpreting symbols. So a lot of our theologians saw the papacy because the, 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 the earlier Reformation movement leaders like Luther and, and Calvin and Wycliffe and, and, and those, those reformers, they interpreted Revelation to, to, to be an uh, uh, indication of the papacy and the Pope and, and what that represented for the whole the system. And we will look at that and see how it applies. And a lot of the Church of God theologians held that view as well. That it related to Roman Catholicism and, and the Pope. And when you honestly you look at the definition that comes out in Revelation 13, you will see that it has application. And, and when the, the last pope was, was taken captive, people thought that that was the end of the papacy. I think that was about 1738. And that how they saw the intervention as, as the beast was wounded and seemed to have died. And, and there were even comments made to the effect that papacy would never rise again. But look, the fact that we have papacy still present with us, the pope still is in a prominent position. He still has world status. And he is still highly respected by world leaders and, 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 and making addresses to Congress and whatnot in the United States. So they see that as a revival. So he was wounded and he was revived. But I will show you how it, how, how it applies to Nero and the Roman Empire, how that was also viewed as dead and was collapsing, and that, that also revived. That's the interpretation. Now the premillennialists will say, that the Antichrist is going to be killed and he is going to revive and the world is going to marvel at him. Again, you have to watch that, that theology because to, to be killed and revived, oh, what power is going to do that? Listen, satanic power cannot kill anybody or revive anybody. Resurrection has to come by God. And, and, and so if you're going to tell that Antichrist is going to be killed and then he's going to come back to life, and the world is going to be amazed. But how is going to how is that going to happen? What power source is going to bring that into place? Has Satan ever read, resurrected anybody from the, from the, from the dead? So those are things that we have to look at when we are making the application. See, so there are three camps, three schools that interpret a lot of what we see in relation to the beast and the dragon, all of those symbols in Revelation that mean these specific things. So what you are saying, yes. There is that interpretive position of the court and the papacy being wounded and being revived and the application fits our particular time. Okay, so we will work with that when we get there. I will also show you how people have used it to apply. But there are some amillennialists who believe that that part of Revelation was referring to something that happened before in relation to Nero and how he persecuted the Christians and how he also seemed to have his empire seemed to have died and then it was revived, things of that nature. So we look at the three positions, examine how they apply the symbols and see what they represent for us to understand what we need to hold on to. Because as they say, all the positions cannot be right. Because then we're going to have a confused theology. And, and, and if they're prophetic, we can't have prophecies related to so many different things. And as they say, one of the, the, the issues I have with the premillennialists is that they speak very precisely as if their interpretation is the one. And you listen to them and they tell you, 
well, Iran, which was formerly called Persia, is going to join with Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Russia and Japan, the kings of East, and come to fight against um, Jer Jerusalem. Now, the Bible does not say that. They interpret it to mean that. And if it's not prophetically accurate, it's going to be proved wrong. Because I've seen them change a lot of the references and applications that they made because of how time changed and, and how news appears and unfolds. And they watch what is happening in the Middle East and, and they make certain predictions based on that. And then go on the whole, they have to change the position because the, the, the whole politics of it changes. And we can't interpret prophecy that way. It has to be precise, it has to have a specific application and specific time. And therefore we need to, to careful of, of being too precise about things that we interpret in as symbols. This is what I'm saying. Revelation is very, very symbolic. We need to make the correct application of symbols. So yes, that's um, an application. And we will look at that in more detail. So let's begin to pick up Revelation 13. As I said, this, this study is going to take us into maybe two or, or even three sessions for us to get a full understanding and make the proper applications. So here we go. John chapter, Revelation chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a great beast rise up out of the sea. You will notice that Revelation also interprets some of the symbols. As we go along, you will see that the symbols are interpreted in the book itself. So we need to pay careful attention to that as well. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. If we could cross reference that with Daniel, Daniel saw beasts also coming up, and in Daniel chapter seven. He said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down. And the ten horns of the ten kingdoms are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the most high. He shall wear up the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and in the dividing of times. That's in Daniel. And that's an interpretation in Daniel given by the angels. So remember, Daniel also saw beasts. And you will watch a parallel as you go through Revelation 13, that there is a there is a, is a harmony or parallel or parallel reference to the beast that Daniel saw and the beast that John is seeing. So he having seven heads and 10 horns, and upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy, symbols. And the beast which I saw was, was like a leopard. And his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Remember anything from Daniel? Maybe we go back to Daniel, we will not, do all the cross references because that would take some time. If we go back to Daniel, you will see reference made to a beast like a leopard, a beast like a bear, and a beast like a lion. Same thing referenced here. And, and we have to look at the parallels because those beasts represented kingdoms, and it was precisely told to Daniel what the kingdoms would be. We see in here now this beast that have um, feet or feet of a bear. And he was like a leopard, and his mouth like a lion. And the dragon gave him power, a seat, and great authority. But watch carefully that they're not separate beasts that you saw in Daniel. Daniel saw separate beasts. What John is saying here, the beast which he saw was like a leopard, had feet that were of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. What could that mean symbolically? We will, we will explain that. It could mean that this beast has characteristics of those 
separate beast that John saw, which represented Babylon, it represented the Medes and the Persians, it represented Greece, and it represented um, Rome. Four beasts that John that Daniel saw. You will get the details of that. What John is saying here is that I, I see a composite of these in the beasts that I'm seeing. So if, it's, if this is the Antichrist, if the beast represents the Antichrist, you've got to tell me now how this applies to him of having, um, he looked like a leopard, feet like a bear, and a mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him a power and a seat and great authority. Now back to the question which was asked a while ago, this is where the people now who, who believe that the beast could be referencing the papacy, what they would argue is, I can see the symbolism in this. Because the papacy had in it elements and practices and belief systems that were connected to all of these empires. It had some elements of Babylonian, Babylonian practice in them. As a matter of fact, the mitre which the Pope wears was the, the same type of headpiece worn by the Babylonian kings. The, the very shape of it. The inscription on it, um, the vicarious Philly D.E. inscription on the mitre came from the Romans. And you can then see how you have Babylonian customs and practices and, and belief systems that came through Rome, Greece, Medes, and the Persian, and Babylon. And you can see the application. I'm just throwing that in to show you how people interpret and really application comes. So yes, they are looking at it symbolically. So we're looking for a bear and a lion and, and, and a leopard, but what they represent are characteristics from these kingdoms. And who the dragon, Revelation describes that the dragon represents the devil. And we saw the dragon appear to the woman very earlier in Revelation chapter 12. I remember, I, I, I to tell you this, I think I mentioned it before. Revelation does not go in chronological sequence, you have to bear that in mind. So, the events coming from the beginning and going right down to chapter 22 do not always follow a chronological pattern. There is a concept called progressive parallelism, which means that what happens is that John repeats some of the same events, giving more details later down. It's not a different event following on from something that was mentioned earlier, but it's just a parallel of it, giving a little more detail. And I will show you that as we go along through Revelation. We don't study the whole book, but we have to study significant sections of it for you to understand the whole interpretation of, of, of what this book represents and what symbols um, are indicating. So I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. We saw how many heads he had. One as it was wounded to death. A deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So this is an indication as I was saying earlier. All that we are seeing that opposes Christianity is really infused by the devil, the dragon. So the dragon is giving his power to this religious or political system that is going to oppose Christians. And let me tell you folks, the Roman political system was, was, was a strong persecuting force to the Christians. And we will see that historically. And when the papacy came along, because the interpretation is, is, is that Satan, through the dragon, Pass on power and authority to the beast, and we see how that works historically. And the, and the Roman Catholic Church came along and do the same thing that Rome did. They, they persecuted Christians, burned them at the stake. And, and, and remember the Inquisition, where, where thousands of Christians um, got, got martyred through the church, the Roman Catholic Church, which was which um, the theologians believe was just the operation of 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 the same Roman power in the church. We will, we will get some details to that. I'm just going through the chapter and just picking out a few things for you because we will, we will close on this, this chapter. 
and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. You see that same thing in Daniel. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months, three and a half years, which we just saw in Daniel. A time and times and the dividing of time. In prophecy, a time represents a year. The dividing of time will be two years and, and, and half a time will be half a year. Time and times, sorry, time and times and the dividing of times. A time is one year, times is the plural, which will be two years, and the dividing of times is half a time, which is three and a half years. So Daniel had the same vision of this three and a half year period that this, this particular fourth beast is dealing with the, with the saints. And, and Daniel here is seeing that the saints are being worn out by this, 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 um, this power for 42 months, which is three and a half years. He opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and, the, and them that dwell in him. So you see the characteristic here is that this beast has connections to the dragon. He has elements of four other world powers in him. And he also is identified as having received a deadly wound that is healed. And he has a strong political power. He is also guilty of blasphemy. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God. And to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and then that dwell in heaven. Given unto him to be war with the saints and to overcome them. And the power was given him over all kindred and towns and nations, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written. See, you see who's going to worship him? Whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life of the Lamb's slain from the foundation of the earth. If any man have an ear, let him hear. We're going to stop at that point. So Revelation 13 here identifies some of the characteristics of the beast. We're going to see how they apply to the Pope a papacy. We're going to see how they apply to, to Nero and, and the, the Roman Empire. And we're going to see how they could apply to the future Antichrist, which will give a position of all three um, our groups, the pre-millennialists, the post-millennialists, and the amillennialists. I indicated before that the the, the post millennials and the amillennials share a lot in common in terms of their interpretation. But the, the pre millennials are, are very, very diverse from, from the other two. So, so here are the characteristics. The beast rises out of the sea, go on. He is a composite of the four beasts that are mentioned in Daniel 7. Three, the dragon gives power and authority to the beast. The beast receives a deadly wound. His deadly wound is healed. He has a strong political power and he also has strong religious power. He is guilty of blasphemy. He makes war with the saints. He rules for a period of 42 months. And, and then as we will go on to see further down, he has a mystery number of 666, which I guess is going to a lot of discussion and dialogue and debate because that seems to be one that a lot of people are most interested in, right? So, so we're going to conclude at that point. So you have an overall perspective of the, of the varying views, bear in mind that we deal with symbolic, symbolic language and we have to interpret. I will pause for any statements or any queries that I have at this time, but read the whole of Revelation 13 and for your homework assignment, read 17. Because 17 is very, very significant because it introduces a woman. And a lot of people are not paying attention to the woman. You know, we pay a lot of attention to the beast. But, but, but there's a character in, in, in this false symbolic language in Revelation that speaks of a woman. And you have a pure woman in Revelation that fell. And then in 17, you have a hard up woman. And she is sitting on the beast. So there have to be a connection between that woman and the beast. And a lot of people only focus on the beast but not the woman. So we're going to have to see what or who this woman represents and how we associate that with the beast. So read Revelation 
chapter 17, and you can read Daniel chapter 7. I'm not going to deal with chapter 9 yet, nor Ezekiel 30 and 39. They will come later down. But that's some heavy theology in, in those passages as well. So you see, the study is going to be very interesting. Don't miss it. And it's going to be very exciting. As we try to unfold and unpack these symbols and try to come up with an understanding of what Paul is saying to us in the book of Revelation, what message he would have been sending to those churches in Asia Minor, seven of them, to which this book had to be circulated. Remember that it was circulated to those churches. We have it now to read, but we still have to see what it meant to them. I will, I will answer our question or two if you have them, or, or else we can conclude for the night. I hope that you have understood so far where have been taking you and on the foundation that we are setting up for this. We always have to set the foundation carefully before we, we set up the building. Thank you very much. Good having you as an audience again, and God bless you. Remember, it's a blessing promise to the person who read the book of Revelation. So read it and get your blessing. Reverend Jackman, Pastor John here. Yes. Just to ask a question. Um, have you ever had the opportunity to read the Key City Symbol by Lily McCutcheon, Church of God Theologian? The read the symbol? The keys, keys to the symbol. Keys to the symbol? No, I, I, I didn't read that. Okay, all right. I'll pass it to you. Yes, I would like to read that. I learned okay. a lot of my books um, that, that dealt with that and, and, it, and it had some, some of the sound of the symbols, but I didn't see that particular book. I, I didn't have not yet. Sorry, okay. not, not the keys to the symbol, the symbol speaks. But symbol the symbol speaks. Okay. December yes. 6th. No, no, I didn't I didn't read that one. Okay. I'll learn it to you. All right. Yes. Thank you. All right, Jeff, it seems like it's over to you. We don't have any more questions or comments. Brother Jeff, are you there? All right, while we're waiting on Jeff, I guess if somebody has a question, they want to bring or comment, they can do that. Reverend Jamon, Colleen Phillips here. Yes, ma'am. Good to hear you. Yeah, um, I think we are at a very interesting position. Uh, the symbols sound very interesting. So my, my, my attention is peaked. I want to I want to really explore the, that section next oh, time. Yes. <laughs> yes. They're, they're very interesting. And yeah. you, will, you will see how they will apply. Mm. Yeah, looking forward to it. And, and, and the, the beauty is, is that we have two of them who have a historical application, the papacy and Nero. The other one with the pre millennialists now we have to be looking for that to unfold. We, we don't have anything to measure against. So you see what I mean? Because we, 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 we wouldn't have anything specific to go by. Because remember, according to their theology, he will only be revealed when the Christians are taken away. So how, how do we measure what the interpretation uh, will be? But you will see how interesting it is as it applies to the Pope and the papacy, how it even applies um, to Nero. But as I said, all the applications cannot be right. So we will see which one we will necessarily tend to hold to as, as, a, as a definitive position that we can, we can come up with because we're just interpreting symbols. But it's going to be really interesting. I think we're going to have a, a, a real a good time together as we study. Yeah, 